Well, good morning. Good to see everyone this morning. We'll be this morning in Acts chapter 3, continuing our journey through, uh, through the book of Acts. This journey that we're calling The Journey Begins, because that's kind of the overall theme of the book of Acts. Acts chapter 3. Now, as you turn to Acts chapter 3, feel free to go ahead and flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 also, because we're going to dig in to a few scriptures, a few verses there in 1 Corinthians 12 as well to kind of tie into our message this morning from Acts. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We ask that you grow us in it, that it changes our hearts, Lord, the way your word uh, is even spoken, Lord, to us, Lord. It's designed to change our hearts, to change our lives. And Father, we thank you for doing that this morning as we submit ourselves to you. Just speak to us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, in our last lesson in the book of Acts, we was in chapter 2, and uh, if you remember, we broke chapter 2 up into two parts because it was quite lengthy once we dug in and, you know, uh, got, you know, just studied the scripture. It was quite lengthy. Now, the title, though, of chapter 2, we give it a title of the outpouring and the outcome, and that's what we saw in the first half of chapter 2 was the outpouring, God's Holy Spirit come upon the disciples as they waited in the upper room. Now, the multitude that had gathered into Jerusalem at this time, they were there for the Feast of Pentecost. So it was quite a group of people. And they were drawn to this 120 or so disciples as they were in the upper room. They were either drawn to the 120 by the sound of the mighty rushing wind that had come into the house. I mean, it certainly, certainly stirred some things up. Or either the speaking in the unknown tongues as the 120 were filled with the Holy Spirit. They began speaking in the unknown tongue. The people were amazed because they heard the disciples glorifying God. They heard them speaking of the wonders of the Lord. So they were drawn there. Peter then stood up because, you know, many were amazed. But then there were some, right? Anytime God does a work in a group. If y'all will, will you cut the light on, Gabriel? Anytime uh, God's doing a work in a group, you're going to have some that's amazed and you're going to have some that mock. So some of these people were mocking. And so Peter stands up and he begins his first sermon here in Acts chapter 2. Now throughout Peter's sermon, we notice something quite uh, dynamic, I believe. He would speak the scripture and then he would expound on it. He would speak some more scripture and then he would expound on it. Because you see, it's the word of God that changes hearts. And Peter knew this, that it was God that would change lives. And in verse 37, we see that hearts were certainly changed. It says, now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter continues by telling them exactly what they should do. Verse 38, then Peter said, unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now we know that the church grew at this time. It grew up to about 3,000 souls, it says, were saved at this point from this message that Peter had preached to them. And as this church is growing, now you got the about 3,000 plus the around 120 disciples, the church is growing and they're focusing on something. In verse 42, we learn what they're focusing on. It says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. See, their focus was on the word of God. Their focus was on worship, this breaking of bread, communion, if you will. They focused on fellowship, one with another, and prayer. You see, they continued in one accord. They were in unity here. The, the birth of the church, they were sharing and caring for each other. Now, if we was to ever pick out any church in the history to say, that's the example, that's what we want to be like, this is it. We have to go back to the very beginning in which we want to be because not long after this, the church certainly starts struggling different ways. False teachings come in, different things happen. Uh, so this, the birth of the church, this is where we would want to be. This is what we would want to be like if we chose an example from the church history to be like. This is it. The outpouring of God's spirit in the lives of the people, it was, it was certainly causing changes in the lives. You see, but their focus, as they were changed, the focus wasn't on themselves. Again, they were sharing and caring for one another. Miracles and signs were taking place. And they were always sure to point to Jesus. 
And that's what we're going to see as we get into chapter 3 this morning. Even more of these mighty things taking place. But they will focus on Jesus. We'll see faith in action this morning. You see, signs and wonders followed the disciples. But again, all glory went to Jesus. So again, hold your finger in 1 Corinthians 12. But if you will, we'll start in Acts chapter 3, verse 1. We read, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer being the ninth hour. We see here right in the first verse a very common practice. These guys were together. They were partners. They were sticking together. In the Air Force, we call this the wingman concept. You always have your, have your buddy, right? You, you have a buddy that sticks close. We might call it a sidekick or, for the lack of a better word, a, a partner in crime, right? These guys were partners. They stuck together. Jesus had sent them out in the Gospels, we remember, in the very like way. In Mark chapter 6, verse 7, we read, speaking of Jesus, And he called unto him the twelve, and began to send them forth by two and two, and gave them power over unclean spirits. So this was very common, them being sent out, them having a partner to go with them. While one's speaking, the other can be praying. While the other one's speaking, this one can be praying. It's a team work. And that's something that as a church, we should sense that same unity. Now, we certainly also must notice uh, what Peter and John went to do. You see, they went to pray. It was the hour of prayer. They stuck with the customs of the Jewish uh, nature at that time. They would pray three times a day, uh, around 9 o'clock, noon, and then 3 o'clock. And this was around 3 o'clock p.m. in which they went to the temple to pray. See, the disciples knew that God was doing a mighty work in their lives. And for them to do the mission that God had set before them, they needed to talk to God. They couldn't do this on their own. It was bigger than them. And this, likewise with us, for us to do what God has called us to do, we have to pray. You see, anytime God calls us to do something, if we feel like we can handle it, we might have to wonder, well, has God really called us to do it, right? Because when God calls us to do something, usually it looks like, I don't know how in the world I'll ever do that. See, because God wants us to draw from him. He wants us to depend on him. He wants us to be praying and communicating with him in order to give us that strength for the task at hand. And then we come to verse 2. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple asked an alms. Now this gate of the temple, it was beautiful. So beautiful, it was even named beautiful. The Jewish historian Josephus described this gate in this way. He says that it was made of fine Corinthian brass, 75 feet high. It had huge double doors. This gate was something else. It was really something to behold, something to look at. It was so beautiful that one commentator said this right here. He says, it greatly excelled those that were only covered with silver and gold. Just only silver and gold, right? This brass gate was so beautiful that it just, it astonished anything else there. But laying next to the beautiful gate, the, the gate that everyone would just love to see, there was something that wasn't so beautiful. See, this man that was lame, lame from his mother's womb, never had walked before. He was laid at the gate. He was an old beggar. That's all he could do. He couldn't get out and work. He couldn't walk to do this or that. But he was brought to the gate and laid there to beg for alms. This would, this would kind of take away some of the appeal, we might think, from the gate. You know, in the world that we live in today, we can go into a big city and maybe look at the tall buildings. Oh, wow. Oh, ooh. You know, just it can catch our breath, but then you don't have to look far. And all of a sudden you see on the side of the road, beside beautiful sights, somebody begging. It says, beggars do, that. this is what this guy did, he asked for money, he asked for alms, and seeing Peter and John, this man asked for alms. Verse 4 says, and Peter fasting, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. You can imagine, and we've all seen it before, when someone asks and they're, they're kind of out begging they don't want to look up, do they? They don't really want to look a person in the eyes. Normally you may hear the can rattle or the, see the sign, but to look a person in the eye, it seems to be something that they're, they're kind of lonely about. And so often, 
how do, how do we do? We don't want to look either, don't we? You know, that's the sad thing, a sad thing to say, but it's common that often we want to turn our heads and not look at those in need as well. But this was not Peter and John's heart. This is not what they did. They looked at this man. It, he got their attention. They fastened their eyes upon him, and they, then they called him to direct his attention to them. Look at us. Then Peter said in verse 6, Silver and gold have I none but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Peter and John could clearly see that there was a greater need than the rattle of the can, the asking for alms. There was certainly a greater need. This man had been lame his whole life. It was important for them to look deeper. You see, often, even in our lives, you know, what someone is asking for is not always what they need. Can we discern? Have we got the gift of discernment to be able to see that, you know, they're asking for this, but what they really need is this. That's the only way we can truly help people is by giving them what they really need. And that was what Peter and John's doing here. Here we see Peter... Uh, is using a gift of discernment. He sees that it's a deeper need. But he will use several other gifts as well. Can you imagine the faith that must have had to stir in Peter's heart to do what he did? It certainly had to bubble up within him because not only did he say, uh, rise and walk, but he grabs the man by the hand to lift him up. Can you imagine what must have went on in his mind? Can you imagine what would go on in our minds? Can you imagine the thoughts that Satan would try to throw in there? Even the thoughts that we would just have ourselves. Well, what if he falls? What if I lift him all the way up and then he can't stand and he falls down? Then I will be accused of just, just ragging on a handicapped guy, right? That's not the type of uh, what Peter and them wanted to be thought of them. Satan can come up with all sorts of excuses why we shouldn't do what God has called us to do. Hebrews 11 verse 6 speaks of faith because we're all to have faith. Uh, Hebrews eleven six says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. No doubt we have faith, right? We all have some faith. We all have enough faith to believe that Jesus died on the cross for us and to be able to come to the Lord. Maybe we even have faith of a mustard seed, right? We know that that much faith can move mountains. But at times in our lives, have you ever experienced a time where something needed to be done and it's like you was just overwhelmed with faith? It's like later you may think, I can't believe I ever said that. I can't believe that I ever believed that because later it's not that you quite have the same faith as you did at that moment. You see, this was a gift of faith that took place in Peter's life. And this is where we're going to look into 1 Corinthians yet. So if you, you keep your spot there in Acts 3, but we're going to look over at 1 Corinthians because we're going to see some of the different gifts and how they're kind of distributed out. We'll see a little concerning about the different gifts. And remember that God gives all these gifts. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we're going to look at 11 verses here. And we'll start in verse 1. This is Paul speaking to the Corinthian church, and he says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Ye know that ye were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, even as ye were led. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Again, Paul's dealing with the Corinthian church. And if you've studied much or looked much into the Corinthian uh, first and second Corinthians, this was a church that had some issues. They were kind of a carnal-minded church. They were self-seeking. Oh, they were good with the gifts. I mean, they operated in the gifts. The gifts flowed fluently through this church. But it was almost to the point that it was, it was not in love. It was not serving others with the gifts that they, they had been given. This could have very well been in part of their past, due to their past. Because notice that at one time they were carried away by these dumb idol, idols, even as they were led. Likewise, our past, I think, can get in our way. We may have uh, grown up with certain perspectives about the spiritual gifts and do they apply? Are they for the church? Are they for today? And so forth. 
Now, where the Corinthian church, they certainly accepted and used the gifts, they also abused the gifts. And I believe that that has caused many churches today to say, well, no, thank you. I will, I will believe that the gifts have ceased. It was back then because of the abuse that takes place. Because many churches today have the same problem. They may use the gifts. The gifts may flow within the church, but they don't use them correctly. They abuse them, actually. But there's also churches today uh, that I think can be just as bad, just as bad as uh, abusing the gifts. We can say, well, we're just going to all out reject the gifts. The gifts of the Spirit is what I'm talking about, the manifestation gifts that we'll see here in a minute. You see, one of the reasons is, again, because of looking at the abuse that comes from other churches in the use of the gifts. But both are wrong, right? Whether we abuse the gifts, if we're a church that's fluent in all the gifts, but we're abusing them, we think that it's lifting us up on a pedestal, or we're hurting others with it, even though we may not be intending to, if you're not using the gifts of God, the gifts of the Holy Spirit correctly, then you're wrong. But again, the denial of the spiritual gifts is operating in the church today is just as wrong. So as a Bible-believing church, we must find a balance, right? Where does this fit in in our lives? You see, we should use the gifts. The gifts are certainly for today, but they're to be used as the Bible directs them. The Bible has to be the, gui the guideline for us. If we get out there on the one side and we're totally abusing them and using them incorrectly in which the, uh, contrary to what the Bible says, we will cause problems. But then if we're not using them, then there's problems as well because we're not fully operating in the way which God would have us to operate. So now we'll look, uh, look a little further in verse 4. See, before the list, before Paul lists the spiritual gifts, he's going to make it clear that although there's many, that there's still just one spirit. There's just one Lord that works in them all. So verse 4 we read, Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. And notice, I want you to really notice verse 11. I mean, I'm sorry, verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. To profit with all. You see, there should always be unity within the spiritual gifts. Notice there the, the commonality. You see the different administrations, but one Lord. Different uh, operations, but one God. So there's certainly unity within the spiritual gifts. You see, because it's all in God. And they should always be to serve God and others. They should never be self-gratifying or seeking uh, for one to lift himself above anybody else. They should be for serving others. Again, verse 7 said, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. To profit the church. The church, the whole church should benefit from the spiritual gifts. Now we'll look at the different gifts. And again, think of what Peter must have been, been thinking. Some of the thoughts that would have been running through his mind as he's lifting this guy up from the gate. Verse 8 says this. It says, to, for to one is given the Spirit. It's given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. To the another, the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, the gift of healing by the same Spirit. To another, working of miracles to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, or that's different, the unknown tongues like we've seen in Acts 2, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these work at the one and the self-same spirit, dividing to every man severally, several as he wills. The spirit is the one that gives these gifts, and he gives it as he wills. What we see here is nine spiritual gifts mentioned. And we could point out a few that probably which Peter had used. The gift of discernment. To be able to discern that this guy needed more than a quick handout. He needed a healing in his life. Faith. It certainly took some faith as he grabbed a man. I mean, it's one thing to say some words and then move on and say, well, if he gets up, he gets up. If he... No, he grabbed the man to lift him up. Then the working of a miracle. This was a miracle of healing. So you see that miracles and healings in this guy's life. They could have all, again, stirred in Peter's heart for this time. 
tomorrow, the next day he might not have quite done the same things, but at this moment, God had stirred these gifts in his life. I think as we look at these gifts, we can say, well, we've seen them work, haven't we? We've seen words of wisdom and words of knowledge. As you see a pastor or a preacher teaching, certainly we should be getting some words of wisdom and words of knowledge. But so often what we want to do is take our pens and mark out a few that we see there, don't we? Can we do that? I mean, if we see the gifts of the Spirit and how they work, we know that they're all given by Him. Do we have the right to mark out certain ones and say, well, that part doesn't apply for today? Or do they all? They certainly all apply in our lives. But again, severally as He wills, as the Spirit wills to give us. Now, as we turn back, if you will, turn back to Acts 3, and we will see the results of what took place in this faith and action that Peter did in verse 8. It says, and he, being the man that was lame, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. So the outcome of Peter's actions by the work of the Holy Ghost in Peter's life, through the working of these spiritual gifts, changed this man's life completely. He was not the same. All his life he had been crippled because of his ankles. Uh, Dr. Luke tells us specifically there were some ankle issues, doesn't he? But now this man was made whole. He could walk. He could leap. He could even enter the temple now. But the greatest gift of all was he was able to really praise God. He was no longer felt maybe despised or looked down upon. He was free to praise the Lord. Now we'll see that he, uh, that this man was not the only one changed here. We'll see that this impacted others as well. This faith and action got the people that was nearby their attention also. Verse 9, it says, And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. Just the sight of this man was a testimony. It was a testimony, the changed life that he had now. Acts 4 verse 22 tells us how old this guy was. It says, For the man was above 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing was showed. So this man probably sat regularly at the gate, taken by his friends, his family, and dropped off in order to make a little money for a long time. This man probably was even sitting here at the point when Jesus passed by. Jesus may have seen this lame man. Jesus didn't heal everybody that he passed by. I remember the guy at the pool, and he asked if he wanted him to be, want to be healed, but there was others around the pool of Bethesda as well. But can you almost imagine Jesus passing by this guy and thinking, oh, you got yours coming. In just a matter of weeks or in a few months, oh, you got your healings coming. You see, sometimes it's a greater miracle in God's time, in his perfect time, than it is in the miracle itself. See, if Jesus, even, if he did think about that, he knew that the apostles would approach this man and that it would bring great wonder and amazement to the people in seeing this. Could have been a greater miracle, them doing it, than what he did. He actually said that, in greater works you'll do than what I have done. Jesus had told the apostles that. So in verse 11, we read, And as the lame man which was healed, healed Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto them, unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? And why look ye so earnestly on us? As though by our power, our own power, our holiness, we had made this man to walk. I'm concerned today that people, if this type of event would take place in our lives, that we would use it for an opportunity to pr promote ourselves. All of a sudden, we would lift ourselves up. We would be the next great healer. And you can almost just see the advertisement right now, right? Well, you come with a limp, but you'll leave with a leap, right? Anything to get the people in to which they could receive. But that was not Peter's mindset. His Peter, uh, Peter's mindset was to glorify the Lord. He was quick to point that this was Jesus, that it was not by any of their own power, you see, they were powerless without the Lord. It didn't accomplish even through any of their acts of holiness. No matter how pure or how perfect they might think they could get, they were holiness-less 
without God as well. You see, they needed Jesus. And it was Jesus, the one that had done this work. In verse 13, Peter will tell them, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers has glorified his son Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed the prince of life whom God has raised up from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong whom you see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him has given him the perfect soundness in the presence of y'all. It was faith. See, as we saw in chapter 2, Peter's laying down some pretty hard words here, right? The Jesus whom ye crucified. It, Peter said this often. He was telling it like it was. You see, this miracle was used to glorify God. And anything that takes place in Peter's life like this, he points to the Lord. And as well, we should. And Peter took the opportunity to speak to him the gospel because that is the main focus. No matter what external things take place in our life no matter what happens in our life healings or different things we'll pray for people but the most important thing is this the gospel that they know jesus and so peter tells them he shares the gospel he speaks of jesus how he was delivered to be crucified by them the prince of peace was then put to death but he don't stop there you see because the next thing is the most important right that god raised him from the dead See, it was through the same faith, faith in the name of Jesus Christ, by which the lame man was made strong. And now Peter's going to give an invitation. After this little message of the miracle, the, the message, now he's going to give an invitation in verse 17. And now, brethren, I want that through ignorance he did it, speaking of them delivering Jesus to be crucified, as did also your rulers. But those things which God before has showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Then in verse 19, he says, Repent ye therefore, and be comforted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Peter showed them that they had fallen. So that's the first step, right? We've got to realize that we're sinners, that we fall short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. Uh, if we say that we're without sin or we call in God a lie, we have to realize our need for the Lord. He tells them that even in their ignorance did this, they did this, but it was still sin. Then he tells them to repent and be converted. Now, in the last chapter, in chapter 2, we saw that they were to repent and be baptized. Here we see that baptism is not a a prerequisite if you will for salvation he doesn't mention the baptism even though baptism is something we want to do because of our converted our repented and converted life so we want to be baptized see there's only one way though to rid ourselves of our wicked sins and that is to repent to say that we're sorry to turn from our sins then our sins are blotted out notice that he speaks of them being blotted out they remember no more. They're cast as far as the east as the west, the Bible tells us. Isaiah 43, verse 25 speaks of this blotting out. It says, I, even I am he that blotteth out thy transgression. For why? For my own sake. And will not remember thy sins. Notice that. God loves us so much, he just wants to blot our sin out. All we have to do is repent, and he blots it out for his sake. Sure, it benefits us too, right? But for God's sake, that's how much he loves us. He wants to blot out our sin. Now, as Peter continues, he says, uh, And he shall see in Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Peter makes it clear that Jesus will not ret return until the time of the restitution of all things. Now since re the repentance of Israel is one of those things, this seems to be what Peter's dealing with. It's been said by different commentators that had Israel repented at this point, it could have been all over. It could have been done with. 
but they did not. As we go into chapter 4 in our next lesson, we'll see that they did not receive the words well. But had they repented and give their life to the Lord, the rapture could have been taking place right then. But they didn't. You see, uh, again, this seems to say that the return of Jesus will not take place until Israel repents. Now, we know that another time will be given. And again, that's why I believe that the focus of end times, the seven years of great tribulation, the, the focus comes back to the children of Israel. See, there will be a great tribulation, a seven-year year period of time that will be set forth for them to repent, for them to come to know the Lord, to draw Israel to repentance. A few other things will take place in that, but that's one of the things is God's focus in drawing the children of Israel to him during that seven-year tribulation. Now Peter will continue with the word of warning. You see, because when we're given the words to lead us to repentance, repent and be converted, but if we reject it, there's certainly warning that, we, that should come because there's a sad times that lie ahead. In verse 22, he says, For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto him, him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. The coming of the Messiah had been foretold, even in the Old Testament, right? Jesus was spoken of, his coming. The days of judgment, the lie ahead was also spoken of. The prophets had spoken of both events. And here, Peter is quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 18 and 19. You see, we read, And I will rise up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. Peter quotes the scripture pretty well. Again, Peter is a man of God's word, and he's given them God's word. And when we hear God's word, we're accountable to it, right? They are accountable to the decision that they'll make. Peter continues with the last few verses here, chapter 3, and now it's words of encouragement to encourage them to come to Christ. He says, You are children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth shall be blessed. Unto you first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you, and turning away every one of you from his iniquities. Now, you probably remember from our Genesis study, we talked about the promise, the Abrahamic promise that come. It was a promise of land. It was a promise of a multitude of people. And then a promise that the, it would be everlasting, that it would be a salvation that would last forever. Remember, we called it the three S's, the sod, the seed, and salvation. This should have meant something to these people here. Because again, Peter's speaking to a Jewish multitude here the people that's gathered around is, is the jews so it should have meant something special to them in him quoting this scripture here it should have touched their heart because they tied into this in a very natural and real sense but in closing now we're going to look at how we tie into it how does the gentile come into this promise that was mentioned as well romans chapter 2 verse 28 tells us for he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not the, in the letter. Whose praise is not of men, but of God. You see, the promise was first to the Jews, but then to the Gentile. It come to us as well. See, God raised up his son, Jesus whom he sent to bless us also. It blessed the Jews, but to bless us as well in turning away all of us from our iniquities. So let us pray. Father, we turn right now, Lord, from our iniquities. We know that we fall short. Father, we have areas in our lives that will certainly require repentance. So we turn and we ask that you forgive us of our sin, Lord God. 
that, Father, you make us what you want us to be. You, you guide us and lead us in the directions that you would help us to go. Father, we ask that as we approach a new week ahead of us, Lord, that you'll just steer us and lead us. Father, let us be the witnesses that you call us to be. Let us step out, Father, with the boldness and uh, the gifts of the Spirit, Father, in everything, Father, that you want us to, to do, Lord. Guide us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.